So um, today's webinar is Sorry, it's like just I am checking the logistics if everything works. So yeah, um, in the first section, we are going to um, actually um, introduce open data, which will be um, done by me and Ivan um, from Audion Project. And then uh, we will pass to Spacer and they will give a short introduction to Copernicus data. And then um, DCD Datum will talk a little bit about data visualization. And then at the last uh, part, uh, we are going to receive some question um, questions and we will try to um, answer them. But meanwhile, if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to write them in the question um, bar um, in your GoToWebinar um, uh, uh, web platform. Um, so the speakers for today's webinar is myself, um, um, Ivan um, Andrada, um, Pablo, and um, Tony. Uh, a little bit about myself, I'm project manager of Audion Project and Catalonia Open Data Hub. Um, and um, I've, uh, I've finished economics and did master in management, and right now I'm doing a PhD in distributed ledger technologies and blockchain. Um, Ivan is um, a computer science engineer. Um, he works in IT department of knowledge innovation market and is also involved in Audion project. He has participated in several open source software development and he is passionate about AI, big data and data analysis. Um, Pablo is um, a remote sensing specialist um, um, trained as field geologist. And it has been five years that um, he, he um, is teaching remote sensing classes for the National uh, National Space um, Activities Commission. Um, it is an Argentinian space agency. And right now he's working um, as geo um, specialist um, and manager at space, uh, Spacer, and he focuses at designing um, and implementing advanced solutions based on um, Earth observation for various um, vertices and, and technology and transfer, um, transfer initiatives. Um, Tony is actually um, working as senior consultant at the City Datum. And this is the Datum is a company that provides strategy and technology consulting services about open data and data management. And Tony has, um, has been in this position for four years uh, right now. And um, he has participated in many open data programs. Um, and at this moment, he is uh, responsible of open data governance um, uh, office in the government of Catalonia. So um, the first section, as I already um, told you, it will be about in, um, open data and we will give a short introduction to open data. Um, Ivan is actually going to give this part, um, but before uh, jumping to, to the content of the, um, the presentation, I actually wanted to introduce you to the Odeon project, which I am project manager. Um, Odeon project is a European funded um, project uh, which is actually uh, has got a grant from Interreg Med, um, and it is um, it, it just started in February of 2017, and it focuses on supporting public institutions um, to increase the quality of the data. And uh, on the other end, it also, it also um, actually sets up intermediaries or uh, digital hubs um, to offer tailored support for the exploitation of open data by SMEs. Um, there are 10 partners from seven countries who are supposed to um, launch seven, um, right now eight actually, um, digital hubs um, in Italy, uh, Montenegro, uh, Croatia, and Slovenia, Greece, Spain. Um, actually, we are going to have two data hubs in Spain, one in Aragon and one in Catalonia, and uh, another one in France. And um, Catalonia Open Hub is part of this digital hubs that are going to be launched in these countries. Um, a little bit about Catalonia Open Data Hub. Um, actually, it supports exploitation of open data and fosters linkages between clusters, SMEs, and startups. Um, 
the mission of the Open Data uh, Hub is to create a public-private partnership in order to bring closer the supply and demand of open data. And the vision is transforming open data into business intelligence tools for creating new business opportunities. Um, the objectives of uh, this data um, hub is to uh, strengthen synergies among different local actors and foster cooperation among various stakeholders. Um, it also uh, aims to train potential users on how to access and use open data services and promote activities and um, entrepreneurial spirit and increase awareness of SMEs, uh, entrepreneurs and citizens about the, the benefits of uh, open data and linked open data and also aims to stimulate generations of new business ideas based on the available open data and maximize open data length uh, and length open data socio-economic benefits. Um, and then how we do it, first we kind of detect detect the data, we identify the data that already exists and is provided by different um, public administrations. And we usually question these, uh, we answer these questions of who provides it, where is the data and how to access it. We then analyze the data, we homogenize the data, and then we start like um, kind of figuring out in, uh, the ways to exploit the data or transform them to business models. And the startups or SMEs who are actually interested in exploitation of the data they then we provide them with um, with support uh, or with the services um, to create their own companies some of the services that we provide to um, data app members are actually uh, facilitation facilitation of collaboration between the members so we will have like some networking events and for and during this events we all, we also try to um, promotion activities related to marketing and visit visibility of the members. Um, we do also, uh, we provide trend scouting, which means um, we search for innovative ideas concerning open data. And um, we also uh, help the companies in innovation management um, and uh, we provide them support tools, um, um, internal and external support tools. Um, then we also facilitate provision and access to trainings for members of the data hub. Um, then right now, Yvonne is going to give you an introduction to data and open data. And then uh, when he's finished, uh, we will continue with Pablo's presentation. Um, um, so Yvonne, you can, yeah. yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. So as we have seen the overview of the Open project and this uh, Catalonia Open Hub project, we are now going to proceed with what is data. So we are going to see an, an overview of what is open data and so on. So first of all, we have to define uh, what is data. So data could be simply a set of facts, information, statistics, resources that we find in the web. And from this, we can extract new knowledge by analyzing all this data and all these resources. So for instance, imagine that I give you this data, 38. This data is meaningless, it has no context, so we cannot extract or derive anything from that. So in order to get something meaningful, we need to get information. For example, we can say that the patient body temperature is 30, 38 degrees Celsius. So now with that, we can do an understanding, for example, saying, well, fever uh, happens between 37.8 and 38.3 degrees Celsius. So we have an understanding and we have a knowledge from that. And later on, we take a decision. We make a decision that is that is that is wisdom. So for example, the patient must stay at bed and take his medication. So for instance, data is basically the lowest level of abstraction from which information and then knowledge and wisdom are derived. So what does open mean we have the term open data but what does open mean well open means that it is a piece of data or content is open if anyone is free to use it uh, reuse or distribute and the openness is based on five principles for example we have the reuse principle that is we can use the content in a wide range of ways then the revised principle 
it is that we can adapt, adjust, or alter the content itself. Third, the remix it combines original on, or combine the original and revised content with uh, other co uh, other open content in order to create something new, any sort of product. Then the distribute is make uh, share copies of the original content or make revisions or remixes with others. And finally, retain is make, own, or control copies of that content. And another another thing is what means to be open. So openness is a combination of basically two main principles. The first one is that we have no technological barriers. So it means that data must be accessible, data must be downloadable, and third, data must be manipulable. manipulable. And there are fast, a ranking of the data that is, that is published uh, throughout the internet, throughout the webs, which is the five-star model. For instance, we have the one star that it corresponds to the files published in PDF or T format. The two stars is the doc, PPT, Excel uh, file format. And from the three stars, we can consider the data to be open data. So for instance, in this, in this case, we have TXT, CSV, and JSON files. And then for four stars, the XML, RDF, RDF file formats. And for five stars, which is the top, XML, RDF, but adding some extra context to that data. And in legal barriers, it means that just the thing that data is reachable through internet does not mean that it is necessarily open. So it has to be associate, associated with licenses, for example, applied to data sets or databases, terms and conditions in order to uh, for web data legal man, uh, language, and also the EULAS for apps and online services. So open data is data that is made available by organizations, businesses, and individuals for anyone to access, use, and share. But however, the OD, and that's what makes the difference, OD needs a license. So for instance, we have two principles in these licenses. First, the, the, the first principle is people who use that data must credit whoever is publishing it. So this is first the attribution principle of the license. And then people who mix that data with other sets of data have to release the result as open data too. So that is the principle of share alike. And why is data so important? Well, um, you may think of data as oil. You might think data could be, for example, there's a quote very important by Clive Humbley that says that data is the new oil or that data is just the it's just like crude as Michael Palmer states, it is valuable, but it's only valuable when we refine it, right? We have a lot of data, but if we do not refine, if we do not process it, it has no uh, actual value. So data must be broken down and analyzed for it to have it some cert, so certain sort of value. So now we're going to see the benefits of open data. For example, in the UK, um, the usage of open data is generating value and making savings. For instance, more than $3 trillion per year are, are coming from revenues just by using open data. The members of the G20 are increasing the 1.1% their GDP over the, uh, the five uh, last years just using open data. 15 to, uh, 15 to 58 million pounds in time are saved per year or 200, 200 million pounds per year are saved in the national health system of the United Kingdom, just using open data. Also, we have to think of the participation and the self-empowerment that it allows the usage of open data that the government or any public entity provides open data to the citizens. So citizens and companies and entities can participate from this process. It also improves uh, or creates a new private, uh, private products. It, it fosters the creation of private products or services and innovation as well. It improves the efficiency, the effectiveness and measurement. And also uh, it provides new knowledge if we combine the data sources and patterns in a large, uh, in a large data volumes. So linked data is another term that we want to discuss about today also. Linked data is 
a method to publish organized data in such a way that it can be linked in a proper and useful way through the web. So it's the way to kind of publish and share the data in a structured way um, via the web. And this, this, this linked data is shared and published by a, a method called the web scraping, which basically focuses on first a technique that, is, that extracts the, the content from a given website. We have a certain website sits in, in HTML pages. Then we have the web scraping technology, which is simply a program designed to kind of simulate the human interaction with the web. And after that, we retrieve the structured data, even though it takes a lot of, a lot of time, but it is provided as an output, uh, very well structured data, could be in XML, uh, SQL, CSV, CSV, et cetera, et cetera. So linked data is based on a cyclical in a cyclical uh, process. So we first will get the URI in order to resource to find the resources of the web of the of the of the web page. Then we get the HTTP access in order to access them. We get the resources of the web, and then we link that to more data. And that's a cycle a cyclical project a cyclical process that is always doing this in order to to update update and and upgrade the data available in the web. So now we have seen linked data. We're going to go a step further, which is big data. So big data, we can think of this as a large amount of data such that it exceeds the capacity of available software to be captured, managed, and processed in a reasonable time. So for that, we need to apply techniques for its use and querying in a pretty optimal way. And there are actually in this in this current world, we have four, the four B challenges, the challenges that is facing big data. First of all, is the massive volume of data generated each day, then the velocity in which all this data is processed, the variety of formats that we can deal with, and finally, the veracity or quality of that data that is being produced and, and treated. And we can think of many players. We can think of Google, Amazon, Twitter, YouTube, companies that are producing each minute millions and millions of files of data of different formats. So it's a massive world. It's a very really interesting world. And the, and the future is based on this kind of technologies, technologies that deal with this data and the, to the, the ones who understand how to, how to process them. And for example, how we have talked about big data, link data, and open data, but however, how are open and big data link? Well, imagine that the aperture of data by the government and institution is leading to a more data available uh, to the public. So for that reason, this generates and supports the appearance of big data, as we have said, which is growing exponentially. So both open and big data need a reference system to locate resources, and that's where linked data appears, and that's the function that linked data uh, does in this sense. So it's the reference system in order to locate and to structure uh, open and big data. And we're going to talk also about gover open government data, which is combining the open government and the open data main principles. They are both two paradigms, and they combine some principles in order to create a new paradigm. So it produces data from government, administration, and public entities regarding to their tasks that they usually do every day. So it has to be open for any citizens, no matter what, uh, no matter what, uh, which purpose it is going to be used for. And it also promotes the citizen participation and collaboration. And for this case, for open data, for open government data, we have some initiatives that have been taken here in Spain. We have datos.com, which is the, the platform that supports uh, a, a, lot, a large amount of data sets regarding to many different sectors in the Spanish economy and the, and the um, enterprises. In Catalonia, we have the Open Data Portal, which also has a wide variety of data and data sets and different uh, resources and APIs in order to locate and deal with this data. Also regarding to tourism, we have the tourism department in Barcelona, which is from the from the from the Barcelona uh, town hall, which is uh, also providing a lot of resources in order to 
create new products or new applications for people who are interested in this in the tourist sector. In the EU, we have the European Data Portal, which is also sharing a lot of information, sharing a lot of, of data sets from different sectors as well. We have agriculture, energy, regions, transport, economy, and so on. And then we have the Copernicus program, which is the program or is the this is a platform that provides every day, every hour, tons of information uh, recompiled, uh, taken from the from the sentinels, from the satellites that we have in the in the European Space Agency program, uh, Copernicus program. Yeah, and right after your presentation, Pablo is going to to give um, a. Um, a, a introduction to Copernicus data and how the um, attendees actually can uh, access the data. Yeah, you can continue. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> one, some moment. So I cannot. One moment. I cannot uh, move. Up. Moment. Yeah, one moment, I cannot uh, change. Okay, okay. And last but not least, for example, we're going to the other continent. We have the USA. They also have a, a large platform storing lots of data sets regarding to different sectors that are very interesting in order to create valuable products for any kind of company ideas or anything else. So that's basically the introduction to open data. So uh, the second section of the webinar uh, will be held by Pablo from um, SpaceSU and is going to give, um, as I already mentioned, an introduction to Copernicus data. Um, Pablo is going to probably talk in Spanish. Um, so please uh, do not hesitate to um, contact him if you have any questions um, that might not be clear. Buenas tardes. Um, siguiente, por favor. Next, please. Um, básicamente voy a hablar del programa Copernicus, eh, que con, consta de varios satélites, eh, más que nada los Sentinel, eh, y de cómo estos eh, satélites pueden generar información. Básicamente, como explicó Iván en la presentación anterior, los satélites lo que hacen es generar datos crudos, eh, Esto es, se transforma en información eh, en, de la forma en la cual los datos se disponen en la, en la misión y finalmente queda de parte del usuario muchas veces eh, transformar esa información en conocimiento y en sabiduría. ¿no? Eh, en la actualidad el planeta está siendo eh, analizado desde el espacio como nunca antes. Hay cientos de misiones satelitales de la Tierra, entre las cuales el programa Copernicus de la Agencia Europea es, es probablemente el más ambicioso. Next, please. Next, please. Eh, ¿Pero qué es una misión satelital? Bueno, básicamente una misión satelital consta de tres segmentos. Eh, el primero es básicamente los satélites y cómo se llegaron los satélites hacia el espacio, el, el segmento de, de vuelo, el segmento espacial. Eh, los satélites capturan datos y mediante un enlace de comunicaciones se comunican con la, que es la estación terrena, que recoge esos datos, eh, le da formato, a partir de unas antenas que van siguiendo a los satélites mientras se van moviendo por su órbita. Y finalmente, luego de procesar y catalogar estas imágenes, se ponen a disposición de los usuarios en diferentes catálogos y repositorios, de los cuales voy a mostrar algunos eh, específicos de Copernicus hacia el final de la presentación. Next, please. Bueno, las misiones Sentinel eh, son la principal fuente de datos de, del programa Copernicus. Hay otras misiones anteriores que también este, tienen datos disponibles a partir de las mismas eh, plataformas y, y catálogos que, que tiene Copernicus, pero las Sentinel son ciertamente las, eh, las joyas de, de, esta, de, esta, de este programa. Entonces tenemos el Sentinel-1, eh, que es, una, es un satélite de radar, que tiene de bueno eso que puede eh, tomar imágenes durante el día y durante la noche, y como la, las ondas de radar atraviesan las nubes, Eh, también puede tomar imágenes eh, a través de la nubosidad, ¿no? en cualquier clima. 
Eh, se usan generalmente para monitorear de infraestructura, eh, también para detectar eh, zonas inundadas, eh, daños por incendios. Eh, también se pueden generar modelos de elevación a partir de estas imágenes e inclusive eh, hacer estudios de desplazamiento del terreno con precisiones de centímetros al año. ¿no? Esto sirve para saber la estabilidad del suelo y, por ejemplo, poder conocer zonas con, donde la estabilidad puede, inestabilidad puede ser un, un peligro. Eh, la constelación Sentinel-2 consta de dos satélites, igual que la Sentinel-1 también, eh, pero en este caso son este, sensores tradicionales, cámaras, eh, que básicamente eh, se utilizan para eh, estudiar eh, tipos de suelo, vegetación, eh, cuerpos de agua y también infraestructura y fenómenos como incendios, inundaciones también. El Sentinel-3, que consta también de dos, eh, una constelación de dos satélites, se utiliza más que nada para monitoreo a escala global eh, de la Tierra y los océanos, se hacen mapas de temperatura de los océanos, por ejemplo. Y Sentinel-5, en este momento hay un precursor, hay un solo satélite, eh, se utiliza para el monitoreo de la composición atmosférica. En la, en la actualidad el precursor no tiene todas las capacidades que va a tener Sentinel-5A y B cuando estén en órbita. Y luego hay dos satélites más, el Sentinel-4 y el Sentinel-6, que todavía no están en órbita, pero el programa Sentinel es un programa a largo plazo, eh, que van a utilizarse para el monitoreo global de la atmósfera y eh, generar eh, mapas de altimetría marítima. Next, please. Bueno, cuando hablamos de satélites tenemos que eh, hablar de órbitas. No hay, no, hay este, escapa, no hay forma de escapar de las órbitas. Básicamente los satélites de observación en su, digamos, pueden seguir dos tipos de órbitas. Las ecuatoriales que van en un plano que contiene el ecuador. O sea, el satélite gira este, en el mismo sentido que gira la Tierra. Y las polares, en las cuales el satélite gira en un plano que contiene el eje de rotación terrestre y utiliza el movimiento del planeta Tierra para barrer todo el planeta. Next, please. Eh, esto tiene, de, tiene, cada una de esas órbitas tiene sus ventajas y sus desventajas. Eh, básicamente para lo que es observación de la Tierra, generalmente son las polares. Las ecuatoriales se dejan más que nada para eh, un tipo de órbita muy particular, que es la órbita geoestacionaria, en la cual el satélite, al girar en las mismas... Este, sentido que la órbita terrestre también lo hace a la misma velocidad. Por lo cual, desde la Tierra se ve el satélite siempre en el mismo punto en el, en el espacio, y el espacio se ve siempre en la misma parte de la Tierra. Eh, esto es muy útil para tomar imágenes muy seguidas, digamos, de un mismo punto. Básicamente los satélites meteorológicos que necesitan tener imágenes con mucha rotatividad, porque la atmósfera es muy dinámica, eh, son de este tipo, son satélites geoestacionarios. Eh, pero tienen de malo que no ofrecen cobertura global. ¿no? En, nunca pasan sobre los polos, con lo cual los polos quedan sin cobertura. En, en el otro caso, los satélites polares eh, ofrecen una cobertura global, ya dije antes que al, al ir barriendo eh, mientras la Tierra gira, eh, van cubriendo toda la Tierra. Obviamente los polos tienen mayor cobertura porque en cada órbita pasan sobre los polos, pero cubren todo el planeta. Eh, un tipo particular de órbita polar que es muy utilizada para la solución de la Tierra es la órbita eh, de régimen heliosincrónico. Esto quiere decir que el satélite pasa siempre a la misma hora solar sobre, el, sobre, la, sobre la, la superficie terrestre. Con lo cual se pueden generar mosaicos eh, de varias pasadas y cubrir eh, en muchas pasadas eh, terrenos eh, muy extensos eh, con la ventaja de que las imágenes poseen la misma iluminación. Next, please. Bueno, eh, con respecto a la resolución temporal, estas es son otras de las características importantes eh, de las imágenes. Básicamente en los satélites polares, cada cierta cantidad de días el satélite pasa exactamente por el mismo punto. Eh, a eso se le llama ciclo de revisita o tiempo de revisita. Y es un parámetro importante si no quiere hacer, por ejemplo, este, una solución satelital basada en monitoreo constante. Bueno, hay que tener en cuenta el tiempo de revisita que generalmente no es... Eh, diario, sino que es cada cierta cantidad de días. La huella es el, el terreno sobre la superficie terrestre que el satélite va cubriendo mientras eh, se va moviendo por el espacio, con sus sensores o cámaras. Y muchas veces si la, si la huella es suficientemente amplia, una misma zona, o también en las zonas más, de altitudes más altas, 
una misma zona puede quedar cubierta por varias órbitas distintas. Con lo cual el ciclo se reduce a un subciclo que probablemente es más ventajoso. Eso quiere decir que en latitudes más altas vamos a tener imágenes cada mayor cantidad de días. O si el satélite tiene mucha, mucha huella, mucho ancho de barrida, mucho, mucha cobertura, también. Siguiente, por favor. Next, please. Eh, la constelación Copérnico, es decir, las constelaciones de Sentinel, poseen dos tipos de sensores, eh, pasivos y activos. Los sensores pasivos, básicamente lo que hacen es recoger la eh, radiación. Un satélite, un sensor, eh, lo que hace es recoger radiación, ¿no? en, energía electromagnética, eh, que es reflejada por la Tierra desde el Sol o bien emitida por la misma Tierra. La Tierra emite energía en forma de... Eh, eh, digamos, energía infrarroja térmica, en forma de temperatura. Eh, los instrumentos pasivos básicamente lo que hacen es captar en forma pasiva esa energía, lo que le llega a los detectores y luego de pasar por, por los lentes y por el sistema óptico. Los activos, en cambio, por ejemplo, los satélites de radar, emiten un pulso electromagnético y lo que hacen es recoger, luego de que ese pulso interactúe con la superficie terrestre, el rebote de ese pulso con lo cual están emitiendo un pulso y eso es lo que les permite, como dije antes, trabajar, por ejemplo, durante la noche. No hace falta una iluminación solar para recoger el pulso. Los satélites de radar, por ejemplo, a diferencia de los pasivos, que las cámaras generalmente apuntan hacia abajo, lo que se llama una actitud nadiral, eh, tienen una actitud oblicua. O sea, la antena apunta hacia el costado del satélite, no hacia abajo de la órbita, sino hacia un costado, puede ser costado derecho y costado izquierdo, y recibe lo que desde la superficie se retrodispersa, se, se, se devuelve hacia el sensor. Next, please. ¿Y qué es una, una imagen digital? Una imagen digital sería un dato muy crudo. Iván habló de, de dato crudo. Este es un ejemplo. En que está compuesta por un montón de eh, celdas que todos conocemos con, con el nombre de pixel y que viene del de, inglés picture element. Es básicamente el elemento mínimo pictórico. Y una imagen es una matriz de píxeles. Es una serie de líneas y columnas eh, de píxeles. Next, please. Y entonces es muy importante, sobre todo cuando uno hace trabajos a diferentes escalas, saber cuál es el tamaño de píxel adecuado. Esta es una imagen de la ciudad desde la que estoy transmitiendo, que es Buenos Aires, con un píxel de una región de la ciudad con un píxel de 250 metros. Como pueden ver, con esta resolución, con este tamaño de píxel, no se distingue prácticamente nada a esta escala. Si uno trabaja en una escala global o una escala regional, probablemente las este, características más importantes del terreno sí se verían. Entonces, el concepto de resolución espacial <coughs> o de tamaño de píxel está íntimamente relacionado al concepto de escala del trabajo que se desea realizar. Next, please. La misma imagen, a 30 metros, uno puede distinguir ya algunas características. Básicamente se ven unos diques, correspondientes a un puerto, y una zona a la derecha con vegetación. Eh, next, please. En esta imagen, ya el píxel es de 10 metros, y se observan eh, los bloques, las manzanas de la ciudad, y más detalle de los diques, se ven algunos barcos sobre estos diques. Eh, next, please. Next. Y en una imagen a 5 metros de píxel ya se pueden distinguir eh, monumentos, autos, eh, algunos edificios muy claramente. De vuelta, básicamente la resolución espacial está íntimamente relacionada a la escala. En el caso de los Sentinel hay... Next, please. En el caso de las eh, imágenes Sentinel hay eh, ejemplos como el Sentinel 5, que trabajan con píxeles mayores a, a un kilómetro, y básicamente son estudios a escala regional o global. Las imágenes de, baja, de, baja, de muy baja resolución generalmente se utilizan para estudios globales, como dije antes, eh, para predicción de clima, monitoreo de atmósfera, océanos o vegetación a escala global. 
Eh, luego hay imágenes de baja resolución con píxeles del rango de una centena de metros. Acá en las la constelaciones Sentinel, la Sentinel 3A, 3B, eh, tienen dos sensores, los cuales trabajan en esta resolución. Eh, se hacen básicamente para estudiar pesos regionales o estacionales. Eh, representa emergencias, si hay por ejemplo una inundación este, y desastres a gran escala. Eh, Después hay imágenes de media resolución con píxeles de decenas de metros. Ya generalmente se utilizan para eh, trabajo sobre agricultura, estudio del suelo. Eh, y también alguna aplicación agroindustrial, forestal, por ejemplo. Y las imágenes de alta y muy alta resolución, con píxeles del rango del metro hasta 10 metros en el caso de la alta resolución. Y el ejemplo Sentinel es el Sentinel 2 y el Sentinel 1. Y este, muy alta resolución con píxeles de menos de un metro. Se utilizan más que nada para trabajos de ingeniería o agricultura de precisión, inventarios forestales, por ejemplo. Eh, o trabajos ya de, de ingeniería, de eh, seguimiento de obras, ese tipo de, de trabajos que requieren, por el tipo de objetos que se necesita distinguir, en una mayor resolución espacial. Next, please. Bueno. A cada píxel en esa matriz que, que comentamos al principio, le corresponde un dato crudo. Ese dato se conoce como número digital. Si ahí ven a la izquierda una, una representación de, de una pirámide tomada este, del espacio, eh, con una imagen de alta resolución. Y a la derecha, esa misma imagen, cómo se vería si, si este, tradujéramos cada uno de esos valores de grises de la imagen a un número. Ese número, que puede estar en diferentes tipos de magnitudes físicas, es el que se usa generalmente para, a partir de algoritmos, eh, obtener información. ¿no? Se pueden hacer este, diferentes procesamientos y, y matemáticos entre, entre diferentes eh, tipos de, de imágenes eh, y generar eh, índices o de abundancia, por ejemplo, de un mineral o de, un, este, o, o de abundancia vegetal eh, a partir del de trabajo sobre estos datos. Next, please. Eh, esto nos lleva al, al concepto de resolución radiométrica, que es básicamente qué tipo y cantidad de datos pueden generarse en, en, en esos eh, números digitales. Eh, en el caso anterior veíamos que los números estaban entre 0 y 255, que eso corresponde a 8 bits, pero los satélites más modernos tienen eh, capacidad de almacenar mayor cantidad de datos, lo cual básicamente se traduce en mayor sensibilidad del sensor. Eh, cuando los sensores captan eh, la radiación, lo que hacen es transformarla en una corriente, y esa corriente se transforma de vuelta eh, hacia un número digital. ¿no? Hay una escala que a diferentes niveles de corriente o, o de potencial eléctrico este, emite un número. Después, en, en, el, en la estación terrena, utilizando... Eh, este número digital y los valores que se usaron para la conversión, se puede llevar de vuelta ese valor del número digital a una magnitud física. Por ejemplo, una magnitud muy conocida que es la radiancia, que indica básicamente la cantidad de potencia que se emite por metro cuadrado de la superficie terrestre. Eso ya tiene un sentido físico, ya es, ya es información, no es un dato sin, sin cru, eh, crudo, y, este, y generalmente se trabaja con imágenes que brindan este tipo de información, o este, ya sea descargándolas directamente con algún tipo de información, o convirtiéndolas uno mismo, utilizando los datos, los metadatos, este, a, a una magnitud física, sobre la cual se puede hacer un trabajo estandarizado. Si no, cada imagen tiene su propia este, escala de valores, digamos. Siguiente, next please. Eh, una gran ventaja de las imágenes eh, satelitales, en, en, entre ellas la Sentinel, es que trabajan en varias partes del espectro electromagnético. Nosotros, nuestros ojos ven una porción mínima del espectro electromagnético, que es lo que se llama el rango visible, que va entre los 400 nanómetros y los 700 nanómetros. Un nanómetro es aproximadamente una mil millonésima de metro, ¿no? uno por 10 a la menos 9 metros. Eh, los satélites eh, tienen también, de, de acuerdo a las zonas de la atmósfera que son transparentes, bueno, toda la atmósfera es transparente a todas las longitudes de onda, tienen bandas, tienen capacidad de captar imágenes, cada imagen es una banda, en diferentes zonas del espectro. Eh, por ejemplo, en el infrarrojo cercano, que se conoce como NIR, por las siglas en inglés, 
el infrarrojo de onda corta, que es el SWIR, o el infrarrojo térmico, que nosotros lo percibiríamos como temperatura, este, que es el TIR, Thermal Infrared. Y luego hay una ventana muy importante, que es donde operan los satélites de radar, que es la ventana de microondas, donde la atmósfera es completamente transparente. Incluyendo la nubosidad, ¿no? La, la atmósfera es en el rango visible y infrarrojo, es transparente, salvo que haya nubes. Next, please. Eh, entonces, esto nos trae el concepto de resolución espectral. Que es básicamente la cantidad de bandas, de porciones del espectro, que son, de las cuales son generadas imágenes. Uno está acostumbrado a trabajar con imágenes color, que básicamente trabajan con tres bandas. Una que corresponde al rojo, una que corresponde al verde, una que corresponde al azul. Y con eso se pueden generar, con diferentes eh, combinaciones de esos tres eh, componentes, se pueden generar todos los demás colores en la experiencia de la visión humana. Un sensor como Sentinel-2 posee más bandas en el infrarrojo eh, cercano. Bueno, ahí se ve la 5, la 6, la 7, la 8A, la 8. En el infrarrojo eh, de onda corta, eh, la 11 y la 12, por ejemplo. Eh, cada una de estas bandas tiene diferentes resoluciones. Hay un Digamos, por trabajar en sectores del espectro eh, más hacia la derecha, ¿no? eso, eso quiere decir que, la, que los fotones, que la energía tiene menor, eh, en, digamos, que los fotones tienen menor energía, con lo cual se requiere de detectores más grandes para producir una respuesta. Esos detectores más grandes quiere decir eh, que la resolución espacial va a ser peor. Así que hay un costo que se paga por querer ver en lugares donde hay menor energía. Eh, next, please. Bueno, y ahora vamos a hablar un poco de, los, de las diferentes eh, constelaciones, se llama, cuando son más de un satélite eh, que componen una misma misión, de las diferentes constelaciones y misiones Sentinel. Eh, la constelación Sentinel-1 eh, compone de dos este, satélites, el 1A y el 1B. El 1A está en órbita desde el 3 de abril de 2014 y el 9 desde el 25 de abril de 2016. En la actualidad están los dos operando. Eh, posee, digamos, diferentes anchas de barrido de acuerdo al, al modo de captura. Un satélite de, eh, de radar, a diferencia de un óptico, como dije antes, toma información hacia el costado, en forma oblicua. Y hay diferentes modos de captura en el cual el rayo o la, la emisión desde la antena puede ser más fina o más gruesa. Si es más fina, cubre un área menor, pero la resolución espacial es mayor. Si es más gruesa, cubre un área mayor, pero la resolución espacial es menor. Entonces ahí también hay otro de los compromisos que muchas veces hay con este tipo de tecnologías. En el momento de elegir el tipo de imagen, eh, no siempre se puede tener todo. No siempre se puede tener la mejor resolución espacial, todas las bandas, eh, o la mejor resolución espacial y la mayor cobertura. Siempre hay eh, estos trade-offs. Con lo cual es importante, más allá de, de, de conocer el tipo de trabajo que se quiere hacer y qué tipo de sensor es el mejor para ese tipo de trabajo, también la escala en la cual se quiere trabajar, ¿no? como dije antes. Eh, en el centro anual, el tamaño de píxeles es variable, el ancho de barrido es variable de acuerdo a estos modos de captura, eh, entre 20 y 400 kilómetros para el ancho de barrido, o sea que en una pasada podría llegar a barrer hasta 400 kilómetros, y el tamaño de píxel puede ser hasta 5 metros, en el caso de que el ancho de barrido sea solamente 20 kilómetros. Eh, trabaja en, en la banda C, la banda C está dentro de las microondas, y corresponde a una longitud de onda de 5,6 centímetros. Esto es sorprendentemente grande. Yo antes estaba hablando, cuando, cuando comenté sobre el, el espectro visible, estaba hablando de nanómetros, de mil millonésimas de metro, y acá estamos hablando de centésimas de metro. Y las, el, estas, estas ondas más largas, interactúan con la materia de una forma muy distinta a una onda corta. Eh, con lo cual, la información que se genera en la imagen de radar no es muy parecida a la información que se genera eh, con una imagen eh, óptica. ¿no? Eh, generalmente es una información sobre la textura de, del terreno y puede dar información sobre las propiedades eléctricas del terreno, que están muchas veces relacionadas, a, por ejemplo, a la humedad del suelo eh, y de la rugosidad del terreno que tiene que ver básicamente con el hecho de que la banda tiene un tamaño similar a las cosas que uno, eh, la longitud de onda de la banda tiene un tamaño similar a las cosas que uno encuentra en el terreno. 
Entonces, el tipo de información que se saca de una imagen satelital eh, de radar, eh, generalmente es complementaria a la imagen óptica, y es muy distinta. Next, please. Eh, un ejemplo de esto es eh, este mapa de, 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 de esta alerta de deslizamientos en, eh, en área en Italia, generada a partir de imágenes de una serie muy larga de imágenes, Sentinel-1, 30 imágenes que creo que corresponden prácticamente a todo un año de observaciones. Eh, y lo que se hizo aquí es, a partir de una, una otra de las propiedades que tienen las imágenes de radar, es que eh, uno puede trabajar con la polarimetría, o sea, las ondas pueden estar polarizadas en diferentes eh, planos. Y también puede estudiar la diferencia de fases entre el rebote en diferentes capturas a lo largo del tiempo. Esa diferencia de fases, si uno reconoce un punto en el cual la onda vuelve siempre, eso se llamaría un, un este, dispersor per persistente o permanente, eh, lo que permite es estudiar diferencias de fase muy pequeñas, que dan movimientos del terreno del orden, como dije antes, de milímetros al año. Y esto puede verificarse utilizando estaciones GPS también, eh, y estudiar con pocas estaciones GPS y, y una buena cantidad de imágenes, cómo se mueve o, o qué, qué estable es el suelo en un área muy grande. Lo cual sería muy difícil de hacer de otra forma, porque habría que poner una enorme cantidad de estaciones GPS, lo que tiene un costo muy alto. Entonces, esto es un ejemplo, digamos, exótico, si se quiere, de la, util de la utilización de imágenes eh, de radar, eh, utilizando procesos de interferometría. Básicamente de estudiar cómo interferirían estas diferentes este, ondas a lo largo del tiempo. Next, please. La constelación Sentinel-2, también consta de dos satélites. Eh, tenemos el Sentinel-2A y el Sentinel-2B, que tienen una órbita bastante, bastante parecida entre los dos. El Sentinel-2A está en órbita del 23 de junio de 2015 y el 2B del 7 de marzo de 2017. En la actualidad están los dos activos. Eh, son sensores de tipo pasivo, como dije antes, básicamente reciben eh, lo, que, lo que se refleja en, en la Tierra a partir de la luz solar. El ancho de barrido es de 290 kilómetros, es bastante amplio. Eh, y tienen tamaño de píxel que varía entre los 10 y los 60 metros de acuerdo a la banda. Tiene bandas en el visible, en el infrarrojo cercano, donde la vegetación, por ejemplo, en el infrarrojo cercano tiene muy buenas, este, un bu muy buen comportamiento espectral que la puede diferenciar de otras cosas, eh, o elementos eh, superficiales. Y eh, bandas en el infrarrojo de banda corta, en total son 13 bandas, y la profundidad de bits es 12 bits. O sea que permite trabajar con, originalmente, cuando uno descarga la imagen en nivel más crudo, tendría... Este, 4.095 escalas, eh, niveles de grises en una escala de gris, ¿no? Cada banda, que es mucho más que lo que ve el ojo humano. Eh, pero, independientemente de eso, eso quiere decir que al transformar la información a alguna magnitud física, va a tener mucha más precisión y se van a poder hacer trabajos eh, con mayor eh, precisión. Next, please. Eh, un ejemplo, por ejemplo, de... de del uso de la Sentinel-2, eh, es este, esta clasificación de coberturas de suelo que, que se realizó en Chad, en la República de Chad, en, en la África subsahariana, y a partir de una serie de... ¿Cómo se construye un mapa de este tipo? No? Básicamente hay índices, utilizando las diferentes bandas, del infrarrojo de onda corta, del infrarrojo cercano y del visible, se hacen operaciones matemáticas entre las bandas y se generan índices eh, de, por ejemplo, la abundancia... Eh, de vegetación, de la abundancia de agua, a través del tiempo. Esos índices se analizan, ya estamos hablando de información, ¿no? los índices ya son información, se analizan este, en contexto de, 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 las, de las lluvias, de, de la estación seca y húmeda en la, en la zona, y eh, eso ya agrega un contexto más amplio, estaríamos hablando de eh, conocimiento. Y eh, a partir del análisis estadístico, es un árbol de decisiones y se genera un mapa que dice, bueno, la mayor parte del año acá hay vegetación, la, la vegetación es abundante, no es abundante, este, acá en la mayor parte del año hay agua, acá en la mayor parte del año no hay vegetación, es suelo desnudo, y este, acá hay dunas, porque es suelo desnudo, pero que además tiene ciertas características este, de, de sombreado o, 
o de elevación que lo hace eh, identificarse como, como una duna. A partir de un mapa como este, de clasificación de cobertura de suelo, se pueden tomar decisiones estratégicas, por ejemplo, a nivel, esto es una, una región dentro de Chad, a nivel municipal, a nivel regional, este, de diversa índole. En este caso era para, para salud pública, pero puede ser para un montón de, de aplicaciones distintas. Y es un mapa complejo generado a partir de un montón de índices, pero siempre a través de este, imágenes Sentinel. Next, please. Um, luego tenemos el Sentinel 3A3B. Este sensor, eh, estos dos sensores, es una constelación también de dos eh, componentes, tiene un ciclo de revisita de 27 días. Algo que tendría que haber mencionado anteriormente, en la Sentinel 1 yo dije que el ciclo de revisita tenía 12 días y en la Sentinel 2 tenía 10 días. Eso es por cada sensor. Pero al ser 2, el ciclo se reduce a la mitad. En este caso es lo mismo. La constelación tiene 27 días de ciclo de revisita, pero, eh, perdón, cada satélite tenía 27 días, pero la constelación tiene la mitad de ese día y medio. Eh, básicamente, eh, son dos satélites, uno está desde el 16 de febrero del 2016 y otro desde el 25 de abril del 2018 en órbita. También son pasivos, de ancho de barrido bastante amplio, por un satélite de uso regional eh, o, o global, ¿no? de ancho de barrido es 1.270 kilómetros. El tamaño de píxeles es 300 metros, que corresponde con esa escala global. Y este, tiene, eh, en el caso de, del primer sensor, porque estos, estos es, satélites tienen dos sensores distintos, uno podría poner más de un sensor en un satélite. Y muchas veces, como en el caso de Sentinel-2, por ejemplo, el mismo sensor en varios satélites. En este caso son dos sensores en dos satélites, este, dos sensores distintos en cada uno en dos satélites, con lo cual son cuatro sensores. ¿no? En total. Eh, el OLSI, que es el que estoy hablando ahora, tiene estas características, 300 metros, son 21 bandas, son muchas bandas. Eh, están hechos más que nada para medir el color de los océanos y esto tiene una, un impacto directo en la cantidad de clorofila en el océano, que tiene un impacto directo en la productividad del océano, en la pesca, etc. Son 21 bandas de una profundidad de bits, 14 bits, que es muy grande, que es la requerida para trabajar con, con océanos. Este, y luego tiene otro instrumento, next please, también pasivo, eh, con ancho de barrio de 1400 kilómetros, que también tiene la capacidad de apuntar su, su sensor hacia atrás, eh, y tamaño de píxel que varía entre los 500 y los 1000 metros, de vuelta son satélites de, de escala global, pero este en particular tiene más eh, bandas en el infrarrojo de onda corta y en el térmico lo cual le permite calcular la temperatura superficial del agua. Son 11 bandas en total con una profundidad de 10 bits. Next, please. Next, please. Un ejemplo de... Uh, the previous one, please. Sorry, the previous one. Yes. Um, en este caso, eh, un mapa realizado con este segundo sensor nos da la temperatura global del océano en un lapso de cuatro días, que es lo que tardó el satélite en barrer todos los océanos, eh, o la constelación en barrer todos los océanos, y se puede observar, eh, bueno, diferentes corrientes oceánicas, como van eh, mostrando su, su um, traza de temperatura eh, por los océanos. ¿no? Acá la, la temperatura varía entre menos 1 grado cerca de la Antártida y en el Ártico, hasta 35 grados en la zona ecuatorial. Eh, y de vuelta, estos, este tipo de, de mapas tienen un impacto directo no solamente en, en la pesca, y en, sino también, obviamente, en el clima. El océano es el principal moderador del clima eh, a nivel global. Entonces, este tipo de mapas generados en forma, eh, con esta resolución que es bastante amplia para un trabajo global, y generados en forma recurrente, son información muy valiosa. Next, please. Y por último, la última misión eh, Sentinel eh, que está actualmente en órbita es la 5P, que es la 5 Precursor, justamente es un, una versión eh, preliminar del, de lo que va a ser Sentinel 5, y tiene una versión preliminar del el sensor que va a estar, el instrumento que va a estar en el Sentinel 5, que se llama Tropomi. Eh, 
tiene una enciclo de revista de un día, porque tiene un ancho de barrio muy amplio, de 2.670 kilómetros. El satélite está desde el 13 de octubre del 2017 en órbita. Y el tamaño de píxel es enorme, 7.000 metros por 3.500 metros. Sin embargo, para este tipo de estudios, este es un satélite que trabaja sobre componentes de la atmósfera, es sorprendentemente bueno. Hasta entonces, hasta el Tropomi, eh, trabajaba con píxeles de 10 kilómetros. Eh, trabaja en varias regiones espe espectrales, tiene una banda de ultravioleta, eso es algo bastante poco común en satélites, visible a un eh, cercano y un infrarrojo onda corta, 8 bandas en total. Y un ejemplo de un producto, una solución que se puede generar con este satélite es el siguiente, next please. Que es un mapa, por ejemplo, de concentración de dióxido de nitrógeno sobre el mar Mediterráneo y se ven zonas eh, donde hay una alta concentración, este es un mapa de concentración relativa, en azul están las zonas más oscuras, eh, las zonas más este, de menor concentración, en rojo las de mayor concentración, y eh, este tipo de productos se pueden descargar desde las... Desde el, no, muchos, uno los podría generar por su cuenta, pero también se pueden descargar muchos de estos productos directamente de los eh, repositorios eh, y, y catálogos de, de Copernicus. Next, please. Bueno, con respecto a, a los satélites, eh, como dije antes, está el 4 y el 6, que van a ser lanzados eh, el, el año que viene y en el 2021. Eh, y también hay planificado ya segunda generación para satélites Sentinel-1, 2 y 3. Eh, algo interesante de Copernicus, eh, de, 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 de lo ambicioso de este programa, es que no solamente trabaja con muchos satélites, con muchas constelaciones, con diferentes propósitos y escalas, sino que además se ha comprometido a mantener eh, una, una elevación a órbita de diferentes satélites a lo largo del tiempo. Básicamente lo que permitiría esto es tener datos consistentes de diferentes satélites eh, a través de las décadas y poder estudiar procesos globales o regionales eh, de degradación del ambiente, por ejemplo, que son procesos que son lentos que en, 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 comparado con la vida útil de un satélite. Un satélite generalmente tiene una vida útil de 5 o 10 años y muchas veces es un proceso eh, eh, de degradación del ambiente o, o de cambios en el ambiente lleva más tiempo que eso. ¿no? Estamos acostumbrados a ver eh, los cambios rápidos del de cal calentamiento global, pero también hay cambios lentos. Y es muy importante poder contar con un acervo histórico eh, para poder hacer estudios y minar datos hacia atrás y minar Columnas de datos que incluyan varios años y varias este, estaciones. Next, please. Y finalmente, quería eh, dar cuatro de los eh, portales eh, favoritos, diría yo, de acceso a datos Copernicus. El primero es el Copernicus Open Access Hub, eh, que está mantenido por Cerco Europe. Eh, este es un portal de acceso, todos los cuatro son portales de acceso libre. Eh, algunos tienen modalidades eh, pagas, pero para hacer algunas cosas en particular. Eh, es, digamos, las imágenes de las diferentes misiones Sentinel se pueden encontrar en estos cuatro portales. El segundo es el Copernicus Data and Information Access Días, que está mantenido por Onda, que creo que es uno de los sponsors de, de esta hackathon. Luego está el Copernicus of Blue, que es de Airbus Space and Defense. Y por último, eh, hay un servicio eh, de, de Data Access eh, de Sentinel en el Data Discovery Hub de Catapult, que es una, una empresa que se dedica a hacer aplicaciones o soluciones basadas en la observación de la Tierra. En los cuatro, eh, estos cuatro portales, como dije antes, hay que, algunos hay que registrarse, otros no pero permiten acceso libre a los datos. Algunos tienen la capacidad de acceder vía API a, a los datos y algunos inclusive tienen la, la posibilidad de hacer el procesamiento online. Uno puede, no hace falta que se descargue la imagen, puede procesar, este, elegir la imagen correspondiente, elegir el nivel de procesamiento que, que requiera para la imagen y, eh, y elegir algún proceso de los que hay en, 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 en el menú y generar... Este, información a partir de estos datos. Que es básicamente, como dijo eh, Iván, el primer paso en llevar un dato crudo hacia una 
este, una información estratégica y la capacidad de poder tomar decisiones en base a imagen, imágenes satelitales. Eh, creo que eso sería todo, estoy terminando unos minutos antes, también empecé unos minutos antes, así que dejo eh, el, la palabra al siguiente y probablemente habrá más tiempo para preguntas, lo cual siempre es bueno. Yeah, thank you so much, Pablo. Yeah, as you mentioned, Soblo and Onda, they're both partners for the hackathon, and tomorrow we are going to have a webinar, and they are going to explain how to access the data of Copernicus. So um, I would like to encourage everyone to participate in tomorrow's um, webinar um, in order not to face uh, any problem in the hackathon day um, for um, for accessing the data. So it's really recommended. Um, now um, I would like to give um, the talk to Tony. Uh, Tony, as I already mentioned, is from DC Data and is going to talk about the tools for visualization of data. Um, uh, let me. Tony, can you hear us? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so let's see if you can pass the slides. Um, yeah, does it work? Uh, let yeah, me it try works. again. Oh yeah, here we go. Perfect. Um, okay, so thank you very much. Uh, in my case, uh, as Loha said, I would like to talk to you about uh, data visualization in the in the context of open data. Uh, okay, whether it's uh, uh, satellite or image data or table data or any kind of data that you can uh, find freely uh, available on the different open data portals. Um, so um, first of all, uh, this is how we model the, the value chain of open data. Uh, if you think on, on open data, as has been explained before, as the data that the public administrations or any organization publish uh, on internet so that it can be freely accessed uh, and reused. Uh, so this, this is the, the main steps of that process which starts with the data creation and, and storage. This is usually a process that happens uh, inside the, um, so it's a, it's a private process that uh, it's derived from the uh, usual activity of uh, administrations and organizations. Uh, they are constantly creating and storing data. Okay, and the first step to publish this data uh, comes with the data collection. We need to identify the data sources, where the data is, which is the owner, uh, which are the different formats and system where this data is stored. And then we have to prepare for the publishing. Okay, prepare for the publishing means that we need to uh, consider how we can adapt the formats so that it can be more easily understood by the users. Uh, think of, for example, uh, maybe internal codes or codifications of the data that may be useless for an external reuser because they don't know what it means or identifiers of a database. We may need to filter these columns before we publish them. Okay, and then also we need to consider or public administrations need to, or any organization publishing, the, publishing data need to consider privacy uh, issues and uh, the current legislation uh, in order to avoid uh, any, any conflict or any problem with that. So once we have identified the data sources and the data is prepared, we publish the data. Data is published in, in, in an open data platform. Later, we will talk about the characteristics and the evolution that this open data platform has undergone in, in recent years. Okay, and then the data is, uh, from, uh, from that moment on, the data is uh, available for everyone to, to use and, and to access to it. Uh, the problem here is that uh, usually public administrations or any kind of organization that publishes data Usually they don't reach uh, a very big audience because there is a gap uh, between the publisher and the final data consumption uh, by, by the citizens or uh, in general. So there, there is a gap that has to be filled, which is this uh, next step uh, that I called uh, creation of products and services. 
Uh, so once the data is published, we need to create products, services, visualizations, or any kind of uh, use uh, on top of that so that most of the people can understand and uh, take profit of these services. And this is where um, data visualizations uh, came in. This, this is one we, what we want to, to talk about. Uh, uh, keep in mind that you, you can see on top of that, uh, on the top of the of this uh, image, uh, who is the responsible to do uh, each process. So the private part is in charge of the public administration or the organization which is publishing the data, and the final goal is to reach the citizens and companies and whatever is our target when we publish this data. But there's an overlap in the middle uh, in this creation of products and services. Basically, basically, what it means is that the creation of a visualization or a web application or a mobile app uh, based on data can be done by the public administration or can be done by an individual citizen or by a company who wants to uh, take profit and create some value on top of that data. Okay, so um, why visualizations are important for open data? So basically data visualizations help us to have a better understanding of, of the data, it helps us to understand uh, more easily what happens with this data. Uh, I I'm said here uh, external internal benefits from the point of view of the administration who publishes data. So uh, externally, it's a better way uh, so creating a visualization or, uh, or uh, infographic is a better, much better way for an administration to connect with the reusers, with the citizens, or with the target of this data because uh, good visualization attracts and, and captures the, the interest of the audience audience and uh, makes uh, simplify the process of uh, understanding this data uh, and, and people can do it very quickly if we have done a, a good and useful visualization. But also uh, administrations um, uh, get some benefits for themselves when they work with open data. Uh, why? So basically because uh, when you publish data and you create a visualization on top of that, you are able to uh, detect errors on your data. This this happens a lot with the organizations that, the, that we work with, uh, and it's a normal process. Uh, it happens all, all the time. You, you cannot guarantee that your data is 100% uh, correct. And some basic examples that usually uh, came out is uh, when you have um, some kind of data which which has a geographical component that is latitude and longitude information. Uh, for example, uh, if you are based in Barcelona and you have some addresses and latitude and longitude, and then you try to plot this on a map, you can very easily see that you may have uh, some points that uh, falls out of Barcelona, which they, and they weren't supposed to be there. Or another typical example is when you uh, sweep, when you put latitude in the place on, long, on the longitude and the other way around, and then the data which ha was supposed to be in Barcelona appears to be uh, somewhere in Africa because of that error uh, between the latitude and longitude. So just simply creating a map, which with the modern tools can take for you uh, five minutes or less, you can detect uh, errors on, on your data. Uh, also, of course, uh, visualization provides better data understanding and allows the organization who's publishing the data to take uh, better decisions based on, on this data. So how do we create uh, visualizations and, why, and what do we need to, to keep in mind? What are the basic concepts and the basic tips to create good visualizations? Uh, I would like to start with this uh, chart. It's a quite famous one. Uh, it was created in 1869 by uh, Charles Minard. And what it represents, this data, is about um, the Napoleon's campaign when he tried to invade Russia in 1812, 1813. 
Um, in this visualization, which, which is uh, pretty famous, uh, shows uh, the history where uh, when Napoleon tried to reach Moscow, uh, his idea was to pressure Russia to avoid uh, them uh, to trade with uh, Britain. That was the main goal of, uh, of Napoleon at the time. And uh, with this visualization, you can easily see that this was a very big failure. Uh, and why this visualization is uh, famous and one is considered what, one of the best visualizations in, in history, some, uh, some say. Uh, so basically because it's intuitive, it, because in so it shows a lot of data uh, in, an, in an easy way. Uh, you, if, you, if you take a look on that, you can see that there are di different, uh, many dimensions of the data that you can, that you can appreciate in the visualization. So uh, first we, we have uh, time, it's a sequential uh, visualization in time. You have location because at the different points of the graph, you can see the different cities where Napoleon's army were uh, at every moment. And also uh, how big is the line uh, means how many effectives, how many soldiers the army had at that moment. You can see uh, that the line uh, is getting smaller and smaller um, as they uh, were reaching Moscow, and then even smaller when they came back to France again. So uh, you can see that it was a major failure because uh, they lost a lot, lots of uh, effectives in this in this mission, and also. Um, at the bottom of the visualization, you have the, the temperature that they were facing at, at every moment. So as you can see, there's a lot of, of information here, but at the same time, it's very easy to, to, to understand and very intuitive. Um, so what makes this visualization so good? Uh, because it uh, applies some of the basic uh, ideas of a successful visualization, which is that it's easy to understand, then, which is also tailored for the target audience. It, this can apply when uh, we want to talk to, a, to an audience with very specific conditions. This we can say, in this case, we are targeting a, a general audience, but we, it, it can happen as well that we, can, we want to talk to a, an audience with very specific knowledge on a very specific domain. Um, also because it answers the key question, the important question. Sometimes we, we have very beautiful visualizations, very attractive, but they don't answer uh, the important question, questions that they were, they were supposed to do. Um, also because they, it, it's a use of the right type of visualization according to the data and because it tells a visual story. So it has a meaning. Um, so how do we choose the right type of visualization? Well, you can find, uh, if you're about to create a visualization uh, and if you, if you're not uh, an expert on that, you can find on, on internet many resources. I got uh, two samples that I would like to show you. Here, uh, here's a very brief summary that can be found on, on internet about uh, which type of visualizations you should use uh, depending on what uh, you like to show. So, uh, for example, here, if you want to uh, compare uh, uh, a lot, lots of values, uh, you should uh, use a bar chart, for example, of, or if you are uh, comparing uh, two different variables, you can use a scatter plot. So you need to be uh, aware of your goal, of what you want, uh, what you want to show and each moment and according to that selecting the visualization and not only select one type of visualization because it's uh, beautiful or because it's more uh, impressive. Okay, um, here I put another resource. Uh, it's, uh, uh, the, so the previous one were, uh, is, it's an image and that one is a website which is more interactive. So uh, I put the link here for you in the case that you can, you want to explore this website and see the different type of visualizations according to the purpose of, of, the, of your visualization and the type of data that, that you have. Okay, uh, and here, uh, here what I wanted to show is some mistakes or something that you definitely want to avoid doing when you are about to create a visualization. So uh, in the first case, uh, you can see that there's a line chart 
uh, this line chart and the A, uh, it's the A case on top left uh, visualization, which uh, gives you uh, the impression of a sequence or a time uh, data. But if you take a close look on that, there's no time on this on this visualization, just uh, different items. So this is the this is the case where we are using or they are using the wrong type of visualization. So the B case is when you use uh, a 3D plot uh, because you want to show many dimensions of the data, but the 3D plot. Uh, you, you, we need to be careful with that because, uh, as you can see, there are some data that cannot be seen in this in this plot. So in the uh, C example, you can see a bar chart here, but uh, in this case, it's kind of uh, unfair, uh, let's say, because if you see the numbers and if you see the uh, the size of the bars, you can see there is something wrong here. So they probably the, the, this chart is not starting at zero, but starting at some point uh, around 5 million, but they didn't uh, show, uh, they decided to not to show the axis for some reason. So that gives uh, a, a wrong impression about the data. And finally, in the D case, this is a chart uh, taken from a paper in, in Nature. And the basic idea here is not that this chart is wrong, it's just, just complex. And it's probably um, the target of this chart is somebody with a very specific knowledge in a domain. So avoid using very complex uh, visualizations if you are targeting a more, let's say, general audience. Uh, okay, so more things. I wanted to talk to you about the terminological architecture that most public administrations are incorporating. And then uh, I will explain how this is related with uh, the visualization uh, part. Okay, so uh, nowadays most of the uh, organizations and public administrations are using uh, this is a high level architecture, uh, technological architecture, but basically what they have is uh, they have a set of internal information systems who are publishing data into an open data platform. Uh, with different uh, mechanisms, but uh, more and more we see that organizations are moving to uh, automatization. So they have automatic processes that publish data into a platform. Uh, and this is, this is very important because we have the data which is more up to date and more reliable. And, and then on top of that, we have a platform that provides API access to, to the data. And this is also very important because we can not only access to this data using the web uh, open data portal uh, to see what's on that, but also we can connect to this data using the APIs and then we can create visualizations connected with this data or mobile uh, applications. Um, so as I said, uh, the open data platform are getting uh, more and more powerful and the main benefits that it has are those that are outlined on, on the right part. So basically modern open data uh, management platforms super big volumes of data. Uh, and as well, uh, so also they super a big number of connections. So there's no problem is there are a lot of views on, on that or a lot of users connecting to this data or to a specific data set uh, at the same time. Uh, also there, easy to integrate with other information system uh, because they incorporate these APIs that, that I mentioned and that has been mentioned uh, before uh, as well by, by Pablo. And also they provide the possibility to export this data in multiple formats, whether it's Excel, CSV, JSON, XML, RDF, so uh, wherever the, it's, it's uh, preferred by the reuser. And also they manage uh, the data catalog so it's easy for the reusers to find to, uh, to find the data. So on top of that, uh, we can connect uh, directly to this data a uh, different set of visualization tools. So uh, if you're about to create a service or a product or simply a visualization, uh, I would recommend this criteria for choosing the visualization tools. And then I will show, uh, after that, I will show you some, some examples. Uh, first of all, uh, it's very, useful and very practical to work on a software as a service model. That means that you have a solution which is in the cloud, so you don't need to install anything on the desktop. You just uh, create a, a user or buy a license when required or whatever, and then you can start directly using 
your your application then uh, because of that you don't need to uh, download the data to your computer but this data can be sent directly to this uh, to this uh, visualization system uh, this uh, this connects with the second point which is uh, that I recommend to use um, the tools that allows you to connect directly uh, using the API okay so the, for the same reason, you don't need to download the data and manually upload it on the on the visualization platform. But instead of that, your visualization is directly connected to the to the data in the platform. Uh, also, newest the newest tools are simple to use. Uh, so some let's say some years ago, uh, the learning curve for most of visualization tools was harder and there was a need for um, specific profiles, people uh, from IT uh, to, to use and to create a visualization, whether it's a map or a dashboard or wherever. Uh, now this, um, this is changing and there is a big part of the visualizations that can be created by non-technical people just, just with uh, some days or weeks on, of, of training. Okay, and finally, um, um, and also important to choose a tool which is which allows you to schedule the refresh process so that uh, once you have created a visualization connected with some data set in the platform uh, you can schedule the refresh process and then always uh, every time that the data in the source changes your visualization will be also updated okay and uh, in this uh, last part I would like to tell you about some tools that I have uh, used or uh, that, that I have seen and that I know that are the, the, the most used tools in the market and some examples of those tools. So first of all, uh, one tool or, or one thing that you, you may consider is when, when working with open data, most of the new uh, open data platform incorporates the functionality of creating visualizations inside the same platform. This is the case of Socrata, but there are other solutions as well as uh, Open Data Soft or uh, Seekan or other tools that you may found that incorporates some of them the possibility to create and uh, and save visualizations inside the Open Data platform. In the case of Socrata, uh, for example, which is the the, the platform used in um, in the government of Catalonia. Uh, uh, you, you can uh, create a user and you create you can uh, once you have a user even if you don't have a user you can create a visualization but if you want to save it you you will need a user which is uh, free to create uh, and in this case the visualization tool of Socrata uh, you, you can see on the top right part of, of the slide some criteria so it's difficulty or basically how easy it is to use the tool uh, responsivity uh, so it's if it's responsive or, or not that, that is if it can be seen uh, easily from a mobile phone and then the user experience how beautiful or how attractive is uh, the final product that you can create in this case uh, the visualizations of Socrata are easy to use they are responsive so if you embed that visualization in a, in a website or in a mobile app uh, they can adapt to, to any device okay and the user experience it's like average because you can do simple things or uh, basic basic things uh, actually the maps are pretty uh, strong and, and and powerful but uh, you, you can't you cannot do a very very complex uh, dive okay uh, i put here some uh, examples this is one example created inside the socrata platform uh, which shows uh, it's based on a data set available on the um, open data platform of the government of Catalonia and this is the use of the soil for agricultural purposes so it's uh, on a specific region in La Sardana in the north close in, in the Pyrenees and it shows what the, the terrain is used for whether it's uh, wine production or is a forest or, or whatever so it, this is uh, based on a table data set and we have uh, converted it into a map because it has the, the coordinates Okay, so this can be very easily created inside the platform. Uh, another example here, this is the data about air quality. In this case, this uh, visualization is created from the, uh, using data from the government of Junta de Castilla y León. 
and the central central Spain region. And the interesting thing here is that it has uh, lots of data start, starting in 1997, and this data has a, it's uh, it has data for every half an hour. So that makes a very very big data set, uh, more than 10 million rows. And as I said before, uh, modern technology can support uh, larger amounts of data and can handle this, this kind of data and creating visualizations on, on top of that uh, without any, any problem. Okay, so another tool that I wanted to, to mention is Power BI. Power BI is a tool uh, from of Microsoft and uh, it's getting more and more used uh, everywhere to create visualization basically because because it's very easy to use and because it creates a very beautiful and uh, attractive uh, results okay as you can see it's uh, we, we we give a very good rating on on difficulty and user experience the only drawback that it has is that the result it's difficult to make it responsive and adapt it to a mobile phone it, actually it can be done you can create a, a visualization for the mobile phone, but uh, it only can be opened with the Power BI app. So you need the Power BI. App, uh, you need to have the Power BI app uh, installed on your mobile phone. But uh, besides that, it's it's a very very powerful tool, and it, it's getting more and more adopted in different uh, administrations. And one of the reasons is that we you can uh, also connect with a data source using the API and then you can schedule the updates uh, whether you, you want it to, to update once a day or every hour or whatever and these uh, can be done for free so other tools uh, can do that as well but you have to pay to, to use this uh, and this in this case for VI uh, allows you to, to do that uh, in the free version which obviously has other other limitations um, so here are some examples of visualizations created with Power BI. Uh, in, the, in the case of the government of, of Catalonia, they are publishing the, uh, a website with uh, the Contracts Explorer. You can see all the contracts that the government of Catalonia has seen. Uh, you can explore, it's, it's very interactive. You have the link on, on, on the slide. And you can filter the data, filter by uh, type of uh, contract, by import, by category or by, by date, and it's a more powerful uh, way to show the data, uh, and it can reach a wider audience uh, in compare with uh, only publishing a very large, uh, let's say, Excel file, which is uh, more difficult to, to process and to understand. And so another example, also the information, uh, statistic information about the public information request that the government of Catalonia received. This, this is all uh, also available on the website of uh, the government of Catalonia. And as you can see, it's, it's a very uh, powerful tool to create this kind of visualization. But um, well, um, how, would, how do you do that? I, I would like to stop here because this is a very uh, used and easy to use tool. So I wanted to show what would be the process to, to create a visualization with Power BI. Uh, with other tools, the process maybe uh, quite similar, but uh, I choose that one to explain because it's particularly easy. So the process in that case to create this kind of visualization that, that I have shown you is, is this one. So first of all, you need to uh, find the data set that you want to use. In this case, uh, for example, the contracts of the government of Catalonia, which uh, is a data set available in the Open Data Portal. If you access to this data set, you will find in the in this case they are using the Socrata platform, and in this platform you will you will find on the top right of of the web the link to the API. As you can see here, you just need to copy this link that is provided by the platform, and we will uh, use this link to access this data from Power BI. So in the second step, we go to Power BI and we uh, select uh, the option of get data. And we select the option, the option web, which means that we will use a web service or an API uh, connection. And then uh, a pop-up like the one right will appear and we just need to copy the link uh, 
here uh, if it's a private link we may need to set the username and password but in this case as it's open data which is freely available you don't need to provide uh, any username nor uh, a password to get the data so we click on connect and then uh, you will see the the uh, this window uh, where we can configure the visualization and you can take a look on the black part on the on the on the right you can see that there is uh, a part which is called fields and in that part you can see the different columns that are contained in our data set in the other part which is called visualizations we need we we have uh, the different kind of visualizations that you can use to create the dashboard okay so the next step will be just to select the different visualizations and put uh, them into into the screen and like uh, in the following step okay so we configure our dashboard for each visualization we can configure which fields which columns we want to show and how we want to show them and also some uh, it allows for some customization uh in the in the colors or depending on the visualization we are using okay so uh here it may require a little bit of training and there are online courses uh, as well but the idea is that once uh, we have configured our visualization in this power bi tool which actually uh, i didn't mention that before but this is this has to be installed on on, on the computer okay this is a desktop solution uh, once this is created uh we click on publish which is on the top menu and then this visualization will be published on the on the cloud on the power bi uh, sorry power bi cloud uh, solution once this visualization is published on on the cloud we go to the cloud which is uh, we can access using the, the website okay and then once this is published on the cloud we can configure uh, the the automatic refresh and we can schedule this refresh uh at the uh, desired frequency so that the data will be uh automatically updated so the visualization will be automatically updated and finally the last step will be to publish this uh on the web and this uh, as you can see here in the menu this will create a code that we can embed on any external website so we can use this visualization to show it on uh, any website, any external website out of uh, Power BI. So as you can see, it's very easy. Of course, uh, uh, in this case, we are assuming that the data is almost perfect uh, to be visualized. But in some cases, we need to we may need to process the data, uh, to filter the data, or to combine the data with other data sources. But once the data is ready, the process for creating a visualization is uh, quite straightforward um okay so here we have another tool which is very very famous and powerful which is uh tableau tableau uh, it's a business intelligence tool uh that is also able to connect to uh, uh lots of different data sources and also it has a desktop version similar to power bi and uh online version it also incorporates a server version if you want to install uh, on premise on our own service in our company uh but the most uh, used uh or the, the the main thing is that you have uh as well the desktop version to create the visualization and the online version to publish the visualization in a similar way uh than that we have done previously with power bi uh the thing with with tableau it's is it's maybe it's more powerful and you it's more flexible in terms of uh responsivity it's more responsive the, the result and the user experience it's very very good but it's a little bit more difficult uh to to learn and also it doesn't allow to connect to an external data source and uh, schedule automatic updates in the free version so in order to do that you need to buy uh, a license um okay so i'm oh, sorry uh so another option is uh high charts high charts is a different uh option it operates in a different way because it's uh it's not a software as a service uh tool like for various tableau but instead of that it's a javascript library that you can use 
to uh, create visualizations inside of uh, your website. So this is much more difficult to use because uh, you need to have uh, like uh, developer skills. Uh, but once you have that, and if you're familiar with JavaScript, it will be uh, pretty easy to use. And the results are responsive, so it can be seen in different uh, devices. And also the user experience is, is quite good. Uh, this uh, technology has been in part used on the, uh, on the portal, on the transparency portal of the government of Catalonia, in particular on the Budget Explorer. So it's, it's like a web application where you can uh, explore and navigate through the budget of the almost 1,000 municipalities that there are in, in Catalonia. You can even compare them. It's very interactive. Uh, so if you have the opportunity to visit this, this portal, many of these visualizations has been created using the, uh, this uh, technology. And uh, another tool that is uh, available is Carto. It is, this is also a refer reference in the market uh, for map visualization in this case. Um, Carto operates only online, uh, so there is only, uh, there's no desktop, desktop uh, version. Uh, it's only accessible on the web. But uh, besides that, the the process is pretty much the same as we mentioned before. We need uh, the URL of the API so that we can connect to the data source. And then also we can schedule automatically the updates. Once we have the data into the platform, uh, it allows for so lots of data processing and transformation using uh, basically SQL. And once our data is ready, we can Config, start configure, configuring our map visualization. Uh, this this uh, map visualization tool is very, very powerful and it incorporates different types of visualizations with uh, different widgets uh, and so on. I have here some uh, an example. This is the same example that, that I uh, showed before, which is the use of the terrain for the different agricultural uh, purposes in, in a region in northern Catalonia, in La Cerdanya. Uh, and this, this uh, first I, I showed you this uh, created with Socrata technology, but this in this case is the same like with Carto. And as you can see on the right side, you have different widgets that are also interactive so that you can explore uh, the data in a more rich uh, and in an interesting way. Okay, you can filter the data for the different uh, uses and see how many uh, areas we have in the image and so on. So uh, if you can take a look of that, it's also a very uh, interesting tool. Okay, and finally, another tool which is also very interesting is uh, Algolia. Algolia, which it does is it's a software as a service solution, which allows you to create, uh, in this case, not exactly a data visualization or a map, but a search engine. So you can search uh, the data as if it was Google, for example. You can think of it uh, a kind of a Google search engine, but connected to the data set that you want. Okay, so it uh, it works only on, on a specific data set and it allows you to create uh, or to configure the visualization, so how you will present this data. Uh, I have an image uh, here on the next uh, slide, and as you can see here, it integrates. Uh, it's it's a it's a part of of the search engine that you can see here. It's very uh, well integrated with the website of the corporation that it's it's using. So it provides a much more rich and easy way to uh, find data and interact with the data rather than uh, looking directly to, uh, to a data set or to an Excel file. Okay, and finally, also I would like to recommend this website, which is called Data Chile. Okay, and it uh, incorporates most of the recommended practices that we mentioned before. Uh, it's easy to, it has a lot of data, uh, um, sorry, it has a lot of visualizations uh, created um, from the open data portal and it's easy to understand it um, it's interactive it tells a story uh, it's very clear so i recommend you also to see this uh, data portal as a or visualization portal 
as a good reference or, or of what is a good uh, dashboard or visualization for. Um, so, okay, so finally, uh, this slide, last uh, slide to summarize a little bit all what we've mentioned here. Um, so first of all, open data, we see open data is a very powerful tool to empower citizens and create economic growth. Uh, we need to keep in mind that all new open data platforms are more robust and more ad adapted for reuse. So we can connect with API. Uh, this platform can handle lots of connections and uh, very big volumes of data. Uh, but there is a need for a community of reusers uh, that create some services, some products that exploit this data so that this data can reach a wider audience. So it's this process of uh, refining the data that uh, Ivan mentioned at the beginning of the, of the presentation. And finally, uh, keep in mind also that there are new visualization tools that are easy and, and cheap to use or to start uh, using them at least. Uh, basically because they are provided as a, in a software as a service model and designed uh, to be to be uh, easy to use by non-technical uh, users. So uh, that was uh, all that I wanted to explain you. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tony. Um, I would like to also thank Pablo and Ivan for their time and effort. Uh, but before uh, finishing the webinar, I would like to see if someone has got any question, um, and I will address. Yeah, there is someone who's asking if you are going to provide the slides. Um, yeah, Ashley, the webinar is going to be online and go to webinar. Uh, so whenever you want to access the uh, slides or the presentation again, um, you just have to log in to go to webinar and you can watch it again. Um, anyone else? If um, you have, uh, again, I'm repeating, if you have any questions, you can write them. Um, and the question bar um, in your platform. Otherwise, I wanted to ask you, Tony, if um, all these platforms that you mentioned, they, um, they are all free or you have to pay for the license? I remember so, that you mentioned that one of them was, uh, you, I mean, we had to pay for the license if we wanted to have like uh, more advanced features. But for example, Power BI, it's, is it um, is it uh, free or um, you have to pay yeah, for the uh, license? Sure, good question. Uh, so I, I didn't provide uh, too much detail on that. It depends actually on, on every one of the solutions. Most of them has a kind of a freemium model, which means that you can start using them for free but with a limited uh, set of tools or functionalities. And if you go, if you want to go beyond that, you have uh, to pay. Um, in the specific case of Power BI, uh, the advantage, uh, the main advantage I would say is that the free version is very powerful. You can use, start using for, for free and you can do everything that we have uh, mentioned here. You can create your visualization, you can publish it online and you can embed your visualization on an external website and make this visualization uh, refresh uh, every day, for example. This is, this, all this is for free, but uh, the thing is that if you want this visualization to be private, that is not public, but private only for you, mm -hmm. and share it with, uh, let's suppose that I want to create a private visualization and share only with you, you and me both, we will need to have a, a license. Okay. Great. Uh, Carlos is asking if we are providing computing resources during the hackathon. Um, if you mean by computing resources, if you mean the laptop, then no, uh, you should come with your own computer. But if you mean the software, still it's a no, we are not uh, providing any applications. Although tomorrow, Soblo and Onda, they are going to explain you how to access the data online. So that's why I was uh, kind of insisting uh, all the participants to actually um, take part in tomorrow's webinar so that they do not miss anything um, important. That's a really important piece. Um, and um, if you do not know from where to get data, then probably it will be difficult for you um, during the hackathon day um, to start working. Um, so 
meanwhile that we are waiting for more answers, um, I would like to also ask Pablo um, about the Copernicus data. Um, so I know that tomorrow we are going to talk about Solo and Onda platforms, but uh, Pablo, um, is it easy to access the data, the Copernicus data, um, or um, what, what is the procedure? Well, um, yes, it's, it's, it's actually very easy. Um, all you have to do is first to have a set of coordinates where you can navigate the map in the different platforms to choose an area. Mm -hmm. Then you will select um, the satellites you will require the images uh, from and uh, uh, um, end date and a start date for a, a search. And then the system will provide you with uh, different options uh, based on the search you, you um, produced. So then you have a different previews of the different imagery and mm -hmm. you will access a link, download link or a, or a, a API link. Mm -hmm. Okay, so great. That's, uh, that's a basic uh, work uh, to, to, to get the images. Um, okay, um, thank you. Um, there is another person which is asking, um, actually he's already saying the, the question to Tony and he's asking if there is any Python uh, libraries recommended to deal with Copernicus data, but both Pablo and, and um, Tony, if any of you have the answer, then it would be great to hear from you. Uh, sure. So uh, definitely Python is a very powerful tool. Uh, I would recommend to use, uh, in fact, the, the, the libraries that I know is, um, let me try to uh, remember the main. Uh, so it's uh, basically Pandas. It's very powerful for, for data analysis. So I would recommend this, this library. Okay, uh, great. Then um, if you do not have any other questions, uh, Although we have uh, some um, more time to take your questions, then um, we will terminate the webinar um, 10 minutes before. Um, although I want to give one more minute for the people um, who still have uh, any concerns or questions regarding the content that we provided uh, in today's webinar. So I think there is no other questions. Um, again, thank you so much. It was an absolute pleasure to have you guys today with us. Um, and I would like to say again, if any of um, um, the companies, both the city Datum and, um, um, and uh, Spacer uh, would like to be a member of uh, Catalonia Open Data Hub, then please, um, contact me or if any of the participants are working with data and they would like to be a member of the hub then um, please reach me out and I would be more than happy to provide you more information on that. Um, then thank you so much uh, everyone and have a good day. Um, there, there, there's another, um, another question at the last moment. Um, they're asking how to reach out so um, um, you can actually um, send me um, an email by um, my email is loha at kimglobal.com um, or if you just send an email to info at kimglobal.com then they will um, they will send you uh, my contact. Um, I will also, um, Anna, I will make sure to maybe I will, um, um, I myself will be um, uh, sending you an email. Um, if other people, um, sorry, I, I didn't provide a slide with my uh, with my information. Um, I will provide. Um, I will send probably my contact to all the participants of the webinar. Um, thank you so much, and um, yeah, that's it. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Bye. -bye.